This is Biblical Insights with Dr. Jim Dennison of the Dennison Forum, answering today's toughest questions. Jim, some will say uh, when I'm talking to them, maybe about what's going on in Scripture or something along those lines, they'll say, well, how do you know Jesus Christ was actually the Son of God? Um, and that can leave me with a hiccup at some points. Uh, what, what would you say in response to that? Well, it's a good question because just because the Bible says he is, isn't convincing for someone that doesn't believe the Bible, you know? Just because the Book of Mormon makes certain claims doesn't mean I necessarily am going to believe them and become a Mormon, or just because the Quran makes statements about Muhammad doesn't mean that I have to believe them. Without believing the Quran, it becomes kind of a circular argument, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So if we say, well, he's the Son of God because the Bible says he's the Son of God, well, some people would like a better answer than that, you know? So years ago, I was graduating from college. My father had died just a few weeks earlier. Um, I was at a retreat, uh, a college um, student retreat. It was a Saturday morning. I woke up and the world caved in. I was going to be graduating in just a few weeks. I was going to get, be getting married, wonderful, and then starting off to seminary and a career in ministry. And on that Saturday morning when I woke up, the question was, why do I believe this? Do I really believe this is true? Enough to give the rest of my life to this enough to graduate and do a seminary and do all that goes with that. Do I really believe this? And if so, why? And so I went for a long walk that morning. I was kind of in charge of the retreat, but other people took over and I just went for a long walk on that Saturday morning. I remember it so well. I remember the uh, clear blue sky. I remember the crunch of the pine needles underneath my feet as I was out hiking. I'd been studying for a while by that point a, a thing called apologetics, which is methods of defending the faith. It comes from the Greek word apologia, meaning to defend or make a defense. And so I began rehearsing in my mind what I'd been learning in this study that I'd been doing of, of evidences for the faith and uh, defenses for the faith. The first thing I began rehearsing in my mind is the fact that we know about Jesus without the Bible. We don't need the New Testament to tell us that Jesus Christ existed, that he was condemned by Pontius Pilate, that he was crucified by the Romans, and that the early Christians believed that he rose from the dead and they worshiped him as God. I can prove that to you using Tacitus and Mara Bar Serapion and Suetonius and Pliny the Younger and Josephus. I can prove that without ever opening a New Testament. And those are all contemporaries of Jesus. Those are not pagan or Roman or Jewish historians who are writing centuries later based on church tradition. Those are people that are contemporaries of the time of Jesus who are recording absolutely everything I just said. That he was condemned by Pontius Pilatus, as Tacitus says. That he was crucified. We have that from Mara Bar Serapion and Suetonius. We have from Pliny the Younger that he was worshipped as a god. That in fact early Christians sang alternate hymns to each other to Christ as to a god. So we know all of that without the New Testament. What we don't have, obviously, proven outside the Bible is the resurrection itself. So that's where I turn to the evidences for the resurrection that don't depend on the biblical witness. We know, again, from Roman and Jewish historians that Jesus was crucified and the early Christians believed him raised from the dead. So where's the body? What happened to the body? If somebody then or now could prove a corpse, could demonstrate or, or display a corpse of Jesus Christ, Christianity would be over. Paul said that if Jesus be not raised from the dead, we're of all men most to be pitied. You know that early enemies of Christianity would have done everything they could to prove Jesus wasn't raised from the dead because if that's true, he's not God and he's a liar and Christianity is false. Mm -hmm. So what happened to the body? Well, here are your options. I was thinking about them as I was walking on that Saturday morning, rehearsing in my mind all of the various approaches and ways that we could do this. You could say that the disciples on that Easter Sunday went to the wrong tomb. And that's why they found it empty. And of course they would find it empty and think Jesus had risen from the dead. And that's why we believe in the resurrection. All right, if you're going to argue that, I would point out that the owner of the tomb, Joseph of Arimathea, clearly knew where the right tomb was. The Romans knew where the right tomb was. They were guarding the tomb. The women saw where Jesus was buried even before Easter Sunday. And against all of that, if the Christians had started proclaiming the resurrection, the authorities would have gone to the proper tomb and produced the corpse and Christianity would be over. So the empty tomb theory doesn't work. So let's say second that the disciples stole the body. That was what the early Jewish authorities claimed. So now you've got these disciples who are so terrified of the Romans that they're meeting behind locked doors. They know that their leader has just been executed as a criminal. Now the empire could be coming for them next. 
Nonetheless, they somehow marshal up the effort, the, the courage, the strength. They overpower battle-hardened Roman guards that are placed on guard at Jesus' tomb, who would be executed by the Romans for dereliction of duty if they allowed this. They somehow overpower these guards. They shove aside the stone. They pull out the corpse. They make him appear alive to 500 people. They throw him in the sky at the ascension, and that's the theory of the disciples stealing the body. Then they died for a lie, and they kept the lie without exception. It was a handful of Watergate conspirators that couldn't keep the Watergate story, and we're supposed to believe that for 20 centuries, Christianity has kept this lie and that these early disciples kept this lie and died for the lie. That's just illogical. That's completely improbable. A third option is that the women stole the body. Now you have all the same problems, plus the women overpowering the battle-hardened Roman guards. A fourth approach is what's known as the swoon theory. A fellow named Hugh Schoenfield tried to argue this. Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He arranged all this with the authorities. He pretended to die or he swooned and he was put in the tomb and then he gets out of the wrappings and he shoves aside the stone and he appears to be resurrected and the early Christians believe in him. So at the cross there was the sword or the spear rather from the uh, Roman guard that was pierced all the way to the pericardial sac around Jesus' heart. That's why blood and water came out. That alone would have killed him. Nonetheless, we're claiming in this wound theory, he survived that. He survived being wrapped in a mummified airtight shroud for three days. He somehow got out of that in such a way that it collapsed on itself because the Gospel of John says that when they came, they saw the head covering collapsed on itself as though the body had simply vanished from inside. Somehow he got out of that miraculously. He shoved aside the stone, overpowered the battle-hardened Roman guards, he appeared through locked doors, and he did the greatest high jump in history at the Ascension. That's the swoon theory. Yeah. And then the only other theory is hallucination. Jesus didn't really rise from the dead, but early Christians so wanted him to be raised from the dead that they believed he did. 500 people don't have the same hallucination, and again, the authorities are going to produce the body. So I'm out walking on that Saturday morning, and I'm rehearsing all of this in my mind, and I come to the conclusion Jesus had to have been raised from the dead. Yeah. If he's raised from the dead, he must be God, and the Bible must be true, and this faith must be worth my life. And it was those arguments for the empty tomb and the resurrection of Jesus that brought me back on that Saturday morning at the end of that long walk, ready to move forward and to continue what I felt God had called me to do. So if someone's asking me why they should believe that Jesus is the Son of God, I would point to evidences outside the Bible that demonstrate that he was crucified by the Romans and believed to be raised by Christians, and then I would point them to the empty tomb. And by the way, the tomb's still empty. I've been there, I've seen it and it's still empty today. Wow, so from, from what I gather from what you're saying that if, if Jesus Christ is who he really says he is, mm -hmm. which you believe is true, yes. then he is the Son of God and that changes everything. It changes everything, yeah. As Spurgeon said that uh, history turns on small hinges. Well, this is the tiny hinge that everything changes on. If Jesus really is the Son of God, everything about human history is different. Everything about a culture is different our post-Christian culture that you and I live in that considers the Bible to be irrelevant if not dangerous and Christian faith to be irrelevant if not dangerous is categorically going in the wrong direction. And decisions we're making that are so counter to biblical morality and biblical sexual morality are categorically going in the wrong direction. All of it because we know Jesus to be the Son of God and therefore the scripture to be true and Christianity to be worth our lives. Thank you for watching Biblical Insights with Dr. Jim Dennison of the Dennison Forum. Follow us by clicking below for more answers to today's toughest questions.